Good afternoon, everyone. It is now 12 o'clock. And as it says on the screen, we will start promptly. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining our monthly webinar. This month, we're focusing on another very timely topic, efficiency in the due diligence process, where the proverbial uh, rubber meets the road. How do we get more efficiency done uh, during the whole period for which uh, an investor is, is uh, looking to make decisions to drive an ESG strategy forward. Oops, excuse me. Um, as always, I want to thank our sponsors, LA Department of Water and Power, DWP, and SoCal Gas for your continued support of our program and the educational content. As usual, attendee lines will be muted. Uh, we will be recording the webinar. Um, as usual, um, my name is Dave Hodgins. I will be the host today. I will have plenty of time for Q&A, I hope. We've got some great speakers today, so do take advantage. Um, slides, recording, everything will be out Friday. Um, tell us how we did. We're gonna keep it conversational. You notice that's a theme um, going forward with our webinars, really trying to treat this more as like a live podcast, a, a conversation. We've got some tremendous uh, resources joining us today, um, real experts in their fields. So looking forward to the conversation. Um, we'll be talking about, uh, as you, you've seen in the run-up to this, efficiency as an asset, as, as a part of the value creation strategy, um, really keeping the rest of the time for an informal conversation. I think you guys uh, know me by this point. So efficiency as an asset, getting into a little bit of framing before we start uh, the discussion today. Um, we've all been following this, uh, but, but clearly you know, ESG metrics are opening the door, are uh, are showing the way forward to increased and, and preserved asset values and, and increasingly avoidance of liability as we see um, regulations around the world progressing as we try to get uh, on track for Paris. Um, we hear the old adage, you can't manage what you can't measure, and really trying to stay ahead of, of investor demand, which we're seeing really, um, really, really uh, accelerating, I'd say, over the last, gosh, 18 to 24 months. And our our, our uh, speakers today are really um, got their fingers on the pulse of what's happening there and looking forward to that conversation. Um, I think there's some other interesting tensions to explore here, though, too, as we see uh, the increased focus and the increasing number of net zero climate pledges, which is fantastic. Um, also, uh, a start of uh, fatigue around uh, reporting. And which of these standards should we be participating in? Which of these um, are really critical and which of these are not gonna get traction? Which of these are investors really paying attention to? Um, so how do we save time in our day as we're all super busy? All of you are taking time out to join uh, this webinar to continue your professional education, to stay up to date on things. That's time out of the day that you're not doing something else right. So time spent um, building the business case, tracking results is super important, but that's also hours that could be spent developing projects, right? Developing strategic partnerships, uh, developing that big next thing whatever that means for your organization. So how do we move forward you know, as people right, with limited time? Um, how do we leverage tools and frameworks to make the right decisions, at least the best decisions that we can on a timeline? Because uh, as we know, the clock is ticking. So diligence, we need to be diligent while moving with alacrity, moving as quickly as we can. Um, so being earnest and consistent in an effort to accomplish what's undertaken, right? We want to be uh, diligent in our pursuit of uh, achieving ESG strategies, creating value, which is the, the business that we are in as real estate professionals and not losing sight of that. So uh, with that, I'd like to get into our panelist introductions. I've been really looking forward to this conversation today. Um, T.D. Wright Chappelle is a leading thinker in the area of sustainable property valuation. Her firm, Sustainable Values Inc., is a leader in this area, and I'll let her um, introduce herself, as well as uh, joined today by Joey Millam and Chris Geyer from Mark Sakubo. They're one of the leading due diligence firms that, that gets hired to really investigate the potential with efficiency, but also other needs, other uh, capital needs that are uh, so critical in this full picture. So with that, guys, um, let's tr 
excuse me, get over to the discussion. And I'll start just by asking each of you to, to introduce yourselves briefly. So Thidi, uh, tell us about how you are involved um, in efficiency projects and due diligence. Kind of how do you touch this topic in your day-to-day? -day? Oh, and you're muted, sorry. Better? That's better. All okay. right, thank you. Good to see everyone. Um, well, my background relative to valuation, um, I've been in this space since about 2003. I wrote the first course on how to value high-performing green buildings for the Appraisal Institute and then wrote the first commercial course uh, on that subject. I currently serve as a director of the Utah CPACE program and manage the process of you know, coordinating project vi viability. And in that regard, the value or upside uh, of a project is really critical in assessing whether or not it, can, it will be able to get financing. And finally, um, I remain active at a national and international level in the valuation community from the standpoint that I work with a group uh, now that are updating the, um, it's a working group uh, for the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors that are updating global standards on ESG and how they impact property valuation. So um, kind of a broad spectrum and um, that's kind of my background. What else, what other questions do you have, David, for me? Thank you, Thede. That's That's a perfect intro. I think you've, okay. you've established your, your bona fides and thanks again for <laughs> making the time. Um, I'll, I'll go uh, next to Chris. I see on the screen as I'm looking at it, Chris, uh, same question. You tell us about how you touch efficiency projects and the due diligence process in your role at Marks Cuba. So I, yeah, I've, I've been at Marks Cuba for 16 years and we are commonly retained by people who are looking at investing in real estate, whether that's buying, selling, financing, possibly insuring or, or otherwise potentially repairing, renovating, rehabbing. Um, we, in the context of those uh, activities, we are, are asked to look at uh, things that are in the energy efficiency realm, like we might do an energy audit on a given building. We, might, well, we also are being asked to look at things that are fall in the, the general realm of sustainability and or resiliency. Uh, the reporting for GRES, with, which, is, uh, which is a common metric that institutional investors in real estate are are using and, and being asked to use, uh, we are tailoring work to be supportive of those kinds of efforts. Great, thank you. And last but not least, Joey Millam with Mark Sacubo. Uh, good afternoon, Dave. Um, I'm Joe Milam. Uh, I'm the Director of Mechanical Engineering, Engineering for Mark Sacubo. Um, I began designing building systems about 38 years ago and have been uh, helping people evaluate, evaluate buildings during uh, due diligence and energy uh, systems for the past 30 something years. I've probably done 10,000 due diligence assessments and maybe 500 energy audits uh, in my career and uh, just happy to be with you here today. Wonderful and thank you, Joe. Well. Well, I've been really looking forward to this conversation. So, without without further ado, um, let's let's get into it. So, uh, we've been talking about you know the sort of explosion, uh, the awakening, right, of of uh, awareness amongst the institutional investors as well as pol policymakers, not just here in this country, but but globally. And how is that starting to you know trickle down and influence transactions? Um, meanwhile, you've got markets that are setting all kinds of new records, um, kind of head scratchers. Um, and you guys are here in the middle uh, trying to help clients navigate and kind of put the pieces together, put their money to work and achieve their, their ESG strategies in the process of doing that. So sounds easy, right? I, I'm, I'm sure we got, we got mm -hmm. this all, all figured out. Um, what are, you know, just some of the challenges um, that you face? And I'll start with, uh, with Mark Sakubo, um, guys, that you face in your role um, as we try to thread this needle. And then I'll, I'll ask Titi a, a similar question from um, how do we kind of take these data points and translate that into evaluation exercise? But, but in practice, you know, how is this going for you guys and, and what are sort of challenges that you're seeing in the field? So the... Uh a primary impediment into implementing some of the things that you're talking about, Dave, is 
the timing that is being demanded uh, to consummate a real estate transaction. Mm. Uh, at present, it seems like from the time that a seller selects a potential buyer on a property, there's 20 to 30 calendar days for them to close it. And they've got to make a non-refundable deposit that's probably well into seven figures, if not eight figures, probably even shorter, take five to 10 days off of what I just said to make that kind of a decision. It's not leaving a lot of time to conduct a lot of due diligence. And this is the energy efficiency aspects that require more data to be supplied, more things just to be studied. It just doesn't happen in those realms. Uh, or it doesn't happen very often. So that is, I would say, the, the biggest impediment to it. I think a second one, and Joey can speak this a little further, is the just the getting the data that we need. Um, Joey, take, take that. Right. The, uh, one of the biggest uh, parts of a, doing an energy audit is getting the utility data. And so what we're finding uh, in many localities is that's very difficult to come by, especially if there are multiple tenants and buildings, multiple meters, it complicates everything. Uh, so one of the things that we're encouraging our clients are to, to begin those negotiations for the utility data during the original um, purchase sale agreements and to get them to get the information flowing as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I want to come back to that point and um, if and how uh, ordinances like we have here in LA or, or as we see in New York and other places are um, getting at that point. But, but um, so we're hearing really compressed timelines and limitations on data makes it hard for you guys to turn something um, meaningful, right, um, for a client who, who does have best intentions. They're trying to execute on the SG strategy here, but we're also trying to be competitive, right, and not bog down transactions. So well, let's come back to that point. But, but TD, on the valuation side, you know, as you get engaged, um, what are some of the challenges that you're having um, as, and, and if you could maybe clarify how you're positioned in the context of the transaction relative to Mark Zacubo and their role? Well, um, from a valuation perspective, uh, we, we have similar challenges relative to valid vetted information data. Mm. Um, we, you know, a lot of appraisers don't have access to engineers or, or, or other, you know, technical uh, data specifically. So um, we look for uh, resources, um, uh, software do, you know, that, that might be available. Um, SRS has their Epic tool that projects, you know, upside as well as the costs and benefits of um, energy efficiency improvements. And that things like that are really helpful for getting data from a third party, um, you know, respected source. We look for independent experts. Mm -hmm. So that the, it, to your point, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So in, in terms of efficiency and accuracy, we're in the market looking for, you know, what those resources might be. Mm -hmm. I, I want to pick up on that and I'll go off script a little bit back to maybe some of your work with the Appraisal Institute and, mm -hmm. and uh, this idea of, you know, third party standard reports, right. That, that folks can kind of get familiar with flip to page three, flip to page, you know, I know what I'm looking for um, like in, mm -hmm. as in a, as in a PCA. So um, I, I wanted to kind of, uh, I guess maybe, Didi, first, uh, invite you to kind of continue on that point. If there are sort of resources or tools that can help with some of that, at least provide a place to put the data if you can get it um, and start to, to standardize that way. Are you? Are, are well, what I think, you know, we're, we're still at a place where a lot of people are trying to figure out exactly what data should be included. You know, the, right. the appraisal mm -hmm. community is still working on, you know, getting up to speed, et cetera. There is a link that I think is available uh, to a green addendum for commercial properties. There's also a residential one, but the Appraisal Institute has created that if an appraiser isn't quite as familiar with the, you know, the items that should be addressed, that's a, that helps provide a framework. Um, you also mentioned another issue, which uh, I work with larger groups that are uh, national, international, whatever. And one of their main issues is consistency, which is very difficult across markets. But um, again, if you can find software, it, it's like the investment community used to use Project. Now they use Argus. 
from an energy perspective, I think um, Epic provides that same input on a consistent basis. And that's what investors really want. They want the approach to be the same. Yeah, consistent approach. Just, and is there like a um, any tools you guys have been looking at, Joey or Chris, that, that kind of give you that kind of rapid, quick look, um, you know, given you've got a compressed timeline, you guess, kind of, or, or considering technologies in that area? The, the, Epic, the Epic software that Thady mentions is, is pretty, pretty nice. Um, we typically want to go a lot deeper than it's able to go. Um, there used to be some benchmarking uh, software available from various companies. Uh, for some reason, those have kind of fallen away. I guess they weren't very profitable to people, but it's, it's tough to get good benchmarking information these days. Uh, but we find find that to be a good um, tool to show a client that if your building were performing at the norm for this area, you could bring your energy consumption or energy efficiency to this level, as opposed to here to here. You know, yeah, you, you need to have a target to shoot for uh, before you even get into the real detailed analysis of of the buildings. Right. I think that point is valid. And, you know, um, that's exactly what Epic is designed for is a first look. You guys that can really, you know, get into the specifics are the second step. You're the ones that are real experts. It, it lets you know if you should even be looking, you know, so I think that's a, that's a very valid. Mm -hmm. And then there are, there are tools um, like the DOE's building energy asset score um, right. and, and audit template, which, um, can help to standardize audit template helps to standardize a, an ASHRAE level two audit so that all of the required fields must be completed or you can't submit the report. We're, we're, we're leaning towards using that for some work that we're, uh, we're building here too. Um, well, and I, I think this goes back to um, expeditious right. and, you know, answers to questions and the compressed time frame. That's what that we're hearing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a lot of folks that we work with are really trying, they're being pushed, uh, as are my uh, fellow presenters, uh, into very abbreviated timelines. So what can you use to help you get there and feel comfortable that it's, you know, accurate? Uh, and right. they're, it's fairly limited, you know, what's in the market. Right, right. Well, let's, let's go back to the point about, uh, about data and energy mm -hmm. data and this, and this compressed timeline. So, um, you know, here in LA, we have our existing buildings, energy, water efficiency ordinance, EBW, as we lovingly call it. Um, so that data is public. Um, it's there on the mayor's open data site. Um, I probably look at it more than anybody, I'm sure, but uh, it's there and it's it's aggregated at the whole building level. Um, LADWP is, has tooled up and is able to do that even for, for multifamily buildings. Um, so that's there, uh, but of course it's it's self-reported. Um, so I, I wonder if we, if you're starting to see or if you're hearing from from clients, um, if this kind of transparency in the market, I think this is one of the big hypotheses, right, with these policies, is that putting this data out there would would start to uh, help people transact, right? Um, we're starting to see that. Or are people aware? I guess it sounds like maybe there's there's some awareness that needs to be raised about what data are out there um, and what would need to be sort of provided, you know, as part of a due diligence process. Um, and of course, the whole country is not um, covered by such ordinances. So maybe that's a, another, another challenge um, there is just keeping up on all of the different policies and available sources of data. Um, I, I would agree. I think, uh, I think, you know, in California, there's Assembly Bill 802, which mm -hmm. requires the disclosure of of the, the benchmarking of buildings with respect to energy performance. That's a regional thing, i.e. California. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not uniform across the United States at this point. But I think the, um, the ability to make others aware of it and people who are investing in real estate to be asking for that because they have a right to ask for it now because it is state law and incorporating that in additional, you know, everyone's making a document request of some sort. So I think to be able to start asking for that would be a, I think it'd be a small step to 
start flushing that data out sooner and making it available to others where I don't think that's always the case now, at least even in, in California where, where I sit. If I could jump in from a valuation perspective, you, you just hit a very important par, point, and that is that it data it really is geographically specific. You know, some is available, but one of the, the important aspects of for users of appraisal services is they can request that data be included in appraisals. They can provide data to <laughs> appraisers. And until, in, in many instances, until appraisers are required or it is part of their scope of work that they, they it, you don't tell them what to do with it, but that they consider these it's factors, fair. then right. it, th there's a real reluctance to go there. So, I mean, that's part and parcel of, of the assignment that these uh, that folks are being given. And it, it's important for owners to be proactive in that regard. Right, right. And I, and I think uh, before we dive into this, this example that you guys provided, which I, I think will be great, mm -hmm. um, there's obviously there's two sides of the coin. There's a buyer and a seller, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, obviously there's you know um, some some tension there, some competing interests, right? And and so um, I think that's a nuance we should keep in mind as we're talking about this. But any mm -hmm. quick reaction? And multiple buyers today. And th yes, <laughs> to boot. Yeah, true. Right. Buyer number two is standing right here with a check in his hand. Buyer number one. If the seller doesn't like buyer number one's terms he just goes to the next guy it's right it's a very right. interesting market today yeah the, the other issue uh to be aware of is that of disclosure which you you almost you know david you know related to but how much does a buyer disclose mm -hmm. right you know, if you're, if, of, right and if i'm a seller and i've and i've made investments and i'm trying to communicate the value that i have created that's that's one that's one model mm -hmm. Whereas if I'm a buyer and I'm looking at either acquiring an asset for a, an ESG you know, focused impact fund where I, I'm really uh, want to achieve and depending on what the strategy is, I'm looking for you know, lead, lead platinum plus, right? Um, or I'm looking for an opportunity to make some investments and, and create value, right? And, and capture that. And so you've got kind of different sides of the coin, but um, really, really, looking at this from a similar framework. So let, maybe this, maybe this example will be fun to kind of tease out some of these ideas. So I think, I think this came from, uh, from the Marks to Kubo guys, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you want to walk us through this, Chris, and I can, I can click when you're ready for me to on the next slide. Joey, go ahead. Yeah, actually, uh, this is one of my examples um, from a, a very, um, very, respected institutional investor who's a client of ours and and they were explaining to us uh, why they are now including energy audits during the due diligence period. And uh, I had a couple of examples here. Uh, this is just a, a typical scenario uh, of an energy audit that you would pay someone to do uh, an energy audit for 10,000 bucks. I use round numbers. And the energy conservation measures that they come up with might cost $250,000, but you might save $50,000 a year in utility costs. Um, a simple payback would be five years. Your return on investment over a seven year hold would be 140%. Uh, so let's look at the effect of shifting the due diligence period. Uh, this is, the typical time frame, uh, years down at the bottom, year zero, uh, you haven't engaged anyone to do the audit. Year one, after you own the property, you spend your $10,000 for a consultant to do the audit. Year two, if you're lucky, you have the money to implement the audit. Sometimes that gets stretched another year. Mm -hmm. And then years three through seven, you begin to see the benefits and energy savings uh, and so the actual, uh, if you do a net present value calculation where you're using the discount rate and bringing all of those cash flows forward, that is a negative net present value. It's minus $7,000 or $10,000. There we go, excellent, thank you. Uh, now in the alternate scenario, 
if you include the $10,000 energy audit in the beginning, in the due diligence period, then you've underwritten that money. It's in your performa to do uh, the $250,000 upgrade the following year. And so it's implemented and you spend that money in year one and then in years two through seven, you begin reaping the benefits uh, of the energy savings. The net present value there is positive $39,000. So that's about a $50,000 swing and um, economic theory says that any net present value less than zero, you should not attempt. Right. And if you apply a cap rate to that, and, and also if it's a net present value that's negative, that's just a, a no. That's a no. <laughs> that's a, like, that's no, a no like project. That. Yeah. So, uh, this is a, we're, we're doing work, we're saving carbon, we're making money, you know, and we're, we're bettering our building. Right. So it, it, this, I love this example, Joey, because it's just, you see, I mean, the time value of money, but you see the sensitivity here and you're not changing anything else about the project, just the fact that you're. It, yes, and these equations, yeah. the cap rate or the discount rate is not that big an influencer as much as the timing. The timing right. of bringing it forward changes the net present value more significantly than the than the cap rates. You could go from right. 2% to 8% and the answer still comes out the same. Mm -hmm. there, there's also an operational aspect of this, meaning, uh, you know, people who own real estate probably are budgeting on an annual basis what they need to do mm -hmm. for the following year. So yeah. you if you miss that train, you just you probably have missed the year because it's a lot based on our experiences, at least it's a lot harder for a for an owner to say, oh, go go spend 10 grand on an energy audit and implement two hundred fifty thousand dollars in in actionable things to do. Um, that probably delays that could delay that a year by, and then you then you know the math as we just demonstrated is even more pronounced. Yeah. So it's it, it's it's putting more pressure on, or it's, it's showing a greater incentive to get that in there earlier. But there's also that it's not a yeah, just it's the way that the uh, I'd say the industry operates in many ways that you know if you don't hit it by budgeting season, they're going to say, well, I can't do that till next year. I got to go ask for and, a and lot in, of money. And in some instances, those budget, it's, they're three-year cycles. So if you, if mm -hmm. you miss it, you may miss it for a couple of years. So you're exactly right. What are some, what are some best practices or, you know, tips, things you see your clients doing well, um, where they're, they're really helping to avoid, you know, missed opportunities or making these handoffs as, as, as smoothly as possible. Yeah. So the, this is where I, I think I have a good case study to bring up here, Dave. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, the, uh, right. it's one of our institutional investor clients. They are an industrial operator. So, uh, you know, as you compare that to other property types, are made, they're, the uh, opportunities for energy efficiency measures are, are not as great as say they are for an office building. But what they have asked us to do and what we have specifically tailored to them to do is to incorporate as much of ESG type principles into our due diligence as we can. That primarily means E for Mark Sakubo. Uh, and they're also looking at submitting this for GRES scoring and the like. So what we've been able to do is identify, you know, the common term is the low hanging fruit, things that we can identify at the same time we're looking at the building to look at condition in that due diligence process. Uh, two examples of that that show up in the industrial product are, you know, switching out lighting to be LED switching out toilets to be low flush toilets, just two quick examples that we can pick, we can pick up and identify that they could do that and even put a cost to those and show them a payback. And they're actually being able to incorporate that into the investment decisions that they're making at that go, no go. And, you know, whether, whether that makes them go or not go, I don't think is in and of itself, but they're at least ready as soon as they close to start implementing those items. So, those are things that can be done. Now that's not a full, you know, comprehensive energy audit or anything like that, but we have been able to talk to them about what they think is easily obtained, achievable, that they can act on. And we've tailored our look to keep those things in mind mm -hmm. with an eye towards if we see a much bigger, more ambitious project to at least identify that you mm -hmm. could take this on, but it requires more study mm -hmm. and or more time and or more money to invest up front. But that's, that's the case study that I wanted to highlight that it actually is going on in a real life sense right now. And I'm, I applaud the, I applaud that organization for being able to move 
they're moving the ball forward on this. It's uh, great to hear that. Um, as as part of that, was there any coordination between you guys and and other um, vendors or consultants? Are they planning to like self perform the work as they uh, go through? Or you mentioned you were doing some pricing as part of it as well. Yeah. So it's a I guess a combination of factors. You know, we've we'll talk to vendors and suppliers of these things as we as they occur. Uh, we've also been able to learn on the on some of these things. We're able to learn you know as we do them that. We think we at least have an estimate of what pricing is. You know, the pricing is always preliminary. You know, given sure. the aforementioned timeframes that we're doing this in. But um, so we we're pulling on our network, if you will, as well as our collective experiences to be able to say, in a couple of simpler simpler areas, here's some here's some anticipated you know costs and anticipated benefits, and that kind of do a pay do a very simple payback mm -hmm. type of analysis on it. Are, are any of you guys, so I just read about a huge, so Didi, I'm going to ask a pace question. Um, I just read about a, a huge transaction in New York City. It was like an $89 million uh, project. And, you know, reading at least, you know, the press coverage of it, part of the motivation was New York's uh, building performance standard. Mm -hmm. You know, to put it in common parlance, it's, it's like a carbon tax, right? It's a, it's a fee that if you don't, mm -hmm. you know, get in under your budget, you pay. Um, that's not going to kick in until 2030 or so, but, but at least, you know, this, this investor, which I think was a, a sovereign wealth fund, mm -hmm. forget which, which country I want to misspeak, um, went ahead and they did a, a $89 million project through PACE, essentially mm -hmm. accelerating projects that they knew about. So um, I guess there's a question in there for all you guys. Um, are we starting to at least hear um, interest in kind of accelerating these sort of bigger MEP type projects or big central plant type work like this project? Or with that or and or, I guess, consideration of PACE or, or alternate alternative uh, up to now, formerly alternative forms of financing to do some of this bigger ticket stuff. So here we're talking about a $250,000 project to decarbonize our buildings is gonna take multiple, multiple billions, right, of investment. So um, a few questions from there. Are we, are we starting to hear some interest in acceleration of, of those bigger projects? Let, let me touch base on that one with, uh, because as of a year or so ago, we had done the largest uh, prior to New York CPACE loan in the US at 54.7 million. It was for a new Marriott Convention Center hotel. And um, I was very familiar with the developer, developer Portman out of Atlanta. And um, their financial advisor was adamant about pace in terms of how it fit into the capital stack. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm certainly hearing more and more about it, particularly from the aspect that it's much less expensive than equity or MES financing. So it's being used to lower the overall weighted cost of capital. So for new, for new, on a for new, new construction, construction. yeah, right. it's, it's really, really strong. And um, I, we certainly have seen a move toward larger developments. And, you know, some of the conversations I've had with larger investors, you know, or international investors are very much focused on alternative or creative ways of financing, but absolutely on future proofing their buildings and with an eye toward ESG not going away, that this is going to be the purview of the future. They just need to be able to validate it, have the metrics to measure it, but they're, I hear a strong commitment to it. Yeah, I can, I can offer up a, a live example, an active project we're involved with that is a, a significant renovation of a, mm -hmm. of a huge property and the PACE funding has become a, a necessary component in the overall financing of the deal. And mm -hmm. it's a, uh, you know, they've, they've been talking to the appropriate pace or related folks. And, but it's, I can see that, that the, the loan that's being underwritten there is uh, the pace is a central component to it. So it's, uh, it's being looked at the, the pace incentives, I think are real and can help and, and get people to move towards doing things that are, are more energy efficient. Right. I, I don't know if everyone's aware, but pace loans are underwritten on building performance. It's not about the owner's credit worthiness. That right. makes a huge difference where, you know, the risk profile associated with that as compared to, you know, the rest of the financing. Right, right. And I think that's a huge point. And I, I left this, uh, this graphic up on purpose because 
whether it's PACE or other other financing, we can kind of ixnay that that big red <laughs> negative exactly. line. Um, and if we do it right, and I've been involved in, in a few of these deals, PACE has not been as active in LA, though it is still technically um, available and something that we're, we're starting to circle back to as we see an interest in these deeper projects. Um, but it's that cash flow positivity, right? How can we, through the combination of rate, which you know, relative to mezzanine debt or equity is pretty competitive, but compared to debt, eh, maybe it's a little expensive, but you're not gonna get 30 year fixed rate debt. Exactly. Period yeah. for anything. So, um, so it's, an interesting, it's an interesting conversation. And what about, um, you know, as we're looking at you know, decarbonization, net zero, um, and 2030 is, you know, we know it's really not a long time from now. And, and I don't think that, you know, most, most buildings, um, at least at the asset level have a, we're talking about now a, a clear sort of blocking and tackling strategy to, to get to there. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. So there, there's some tensions, right? I talked about like time in the day. I, I want to go back to, you know, reporting, um, building the business case, and then you know project development, right? How do we take the information that you guys are, are generating, uh, Chris and Joe, and the work that you're doing on the field and working you know, with clients, and plug that into frameworks that that help uh, you know capital move? Um, and, and so the clients are sort of in the middle of this, right? So wh what are you guys what are you guys hearing, and and how do we kind of prevent uh, fatigue, right? We can't gas out when we're just at, in in year one of the decade of action. We gotta we gotta hydrate and stay in the race. What what are you guys seeing? Where sh where should we be be focusing? In terms of of um, frameworks, and you're supposed to say on the due diligence process and finding <laughs> more ways to drive efficiency. Um, I guess. Go ahead. Uh, Joey. Go ahead. No, I, I don't have a response. Uh, this past year has been so crazy. <laughs> it's all unleashed at once this year. as, as right. you know. So uh, yeah, we're, we're running it over maximum capacity. <laughs> so I think everyone is. So I, I guess I'm asking, um, how should we be thinking about uh, a starting point, right? And and as we're, we're looking at, you know, um, opportunities to... Um, get as you're doing here. So let's explore this a little bit more. Um, how did this client sort of come to this realization and, and operationalize this in practice? This idea of, of making the audit okay. you know, really part of like, how did that realization occur? How did that conversation go with you guys? Um, you know, how, how did, how did you get to this strategy? Sure. Yeah. So that, that was okay. So that on that point, the, uh, the client, I think this is typical, I don't think they're unique in this regard, but they were being told by top of the organization, we're going to submit our portfolio to Grez to get scored. So we want that score to be as high as we can because that is a competitive necessity to our, to our clients, to the investor base at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So that moved to, okay, well, if we're going to submit to Grez, how do we extract from typical due diligence that we're doing? Uh, how to, uh, what, what can we take out of that and apply towards said application? And also recognizing there's probably some abilities for us to save money operationally, lower utility usage um, amongst them. So how can we do that? You know, what's possible as well as what's not possible. And, and there was a, I think a healthy discussion about what we can do as well as what we cannot. Because we can't do everything that we want. We can, we're not going to do everything that you like. And that, that, that yielded those examples I talked about, you know, the, the lighting, the, the restroom fixtures, as, as a couple of easy examples of things that could be identified fairly simply in the field. They're common so that they can be, we can apply, you know, some historical evidence or so historicals on what it would cost, a simple payback and give them a roadmap of what they need to do going forward. So what were some things that got kicked out? Did you guys, did you consider um, HVAC units or are, are, are their properties conditioned? Uh, that, that one show, or let me answer real quick, Joe, but you can expand on it. But that one may, you know, if we're going to replace 
air conditioning units because they're already kind of near the end of their life, yes, then let's think about what's the, the best new to get and the most energy efficient one to get going forward. So as opposed to the, we're going to rip out all the HVAC units because they're, eight, they're seven to eight years old, we're not going to do that because they're going to last another, you know, 10 years or so. But when we do it, we're going to have a plan in place to go there. But Joey, you can elaborate on that further. Well, I think uh, I was going to going back to this particular client. Um, one of the reasons that's pushed them towards the Grebs, Grebs reporting is their clients, the okay. huge pension funds and sovereign funds and people like that that are bringing the billions of dollars to them to invest for them said, we want to see what your footprint is. We want to see what your environmental policies are. And if we were comparing you against investment firm A and investment firm B, the one with the better environmental ESG policy, that's the one that we're going to put our money with. And so it became a, a marketing advantage for them to, to, to get in there and go deep with this. And then I think along the way, they discovered that, hey, uh, this is not just marketing. We're actually cutting our operating expenses here. And let's, let's look and see how we can do this better. Um, I will say that <laughs> I'm tooting my own horn here, but one of the key people in this client's organization is a mechanical engineer who studied finance. So he, he uh. understands this stuff and he, he lives it. And uh, he's a great client because he understands all the intricacies of energy and engineering uh from that respect he's a tough client because you can't uh fool him <laughs> so, so, David, so he was he was probably instrumental to that sort of realization so it sounds like it kind of came down from up high look we need to up our game on this because our investors are asking and and their clients are asking and so it occurred to him because he sort of understands this space hey maybe we can integrate this further up into our process makes sense. Sorry, Thea, did you want to add something? No, I, I was just going to comment. It like what I'm hearing is e exactly what's being described. And that is a concern uh, about, you know, funds, capital, where it's going to be placed. And the one, the buildings, the groups, the investment managers that are more competitive and can provide validation of their longer term goals, actually making them money, doing the cost benefit analyses up front to see where the upside is. That's where, you know, those are the, the firms, groups that are seen as, you know, ones with the greatest potential going forward. That's, that's where what capital is seeking at this point in time from everything that I hear in the markets. And mm -hmm. it, it's very much about energy, you know, all the different aspects of that. Are, are you seeing clients, Didi, starting to kind of beef up their sustainability teams, whether that's, you know, internally or, or with consultants. I mean, you know, I just meant, you know, Joey mentioned so great when you've got, you know, someone on the other side who really understands not only their own organization and the buildings, but um, some of the nuance of, you know, efficiency. Well, and, it, yeah. in, interestingly, I had a, a conversation earlier today with an individual that moved from one major investment group to another and um, both of which were international, national and international. But the initial group um, uh, in that scenario, uh, this individual had very limited resources. And, and we were talking a little bit earlier about spending all your time trying to um, just gather information. What are you going to do with it? As opposed to having not only that, but time allocation of, of maybe even one more person that can help you gather the data. Because at this point in time, with all the discussion about ESG, with the different metrics that people are using, there, there is no one set of data that everyone has necessarily decided upon is the best set of data. Mm -hmm. Everyone's trying to you know, figure out how this should be assessed, what, you know, what priority you give to different strategies. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're scrambling in a way to put together as much debt as they can to support their position and their, the approach that they're taking to a more sustainable, you know, efficient uh, portfolio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, Dave, I have seen uh, some of our, some clients that we have have their own internal directors of sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are hiring sustainability consulting firms to 
give them the 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 opinion, the expertise that they otherwise don't have in house, or some or or all of the above. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that is something certainly a change I've seen over the past three years. I would say where I didn't see as much of that three years ago as I do now. Mm-hmm. To 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 support some of that sort of uh, cross those cross cutting strategies, right? That the yeah you know, working across. Uh, groups and silos. That's, that's great to see. And we see, uh, you know, more and more of our LABBC partners, yeah, establishing sustainability departments, not just, you know, well, having a person is obviously the first start and, and, uh, you know, not all companies um, necessarily have an internal resource to begin with. So I guess starting at the start, but interesting and makes sense that you're seeing uh, folks adding more capacity as we try to really, you know, get our arms around, this and um, you know capture the information that's going to spin the flywheel, right? Yeah. And it's in the case in the case capital. study that that I gave, I think that that particular organization is is relying on us to a certain extent to be at least a part of that. You know, we're we're not we're not a sustainability consultant. The fact that we can advise on all aspects of ESG per se, but to the point that it gets to the property level, I think we're you know they're viewing us as a consultant or a part of that team for their organization. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Part of the equation that I think is really important, and, and I think everybody here is probably aware of it, though, is the fact that the market has a real tendency to focus on cost and not as much of, uh, I won't say an appetite, or but an ability to actually identify and acknowledge the benefits. And a lot of the longer term benefits of you know, these strategies tend to get left out of the equation. It, it makes a big difference if you're looking at, for example, the health aspects, and those don't always get factored in. There, there's, so, also, there's also an investment horizon. Sometimes it's really short, right. and they might be looking, so a client might be looking to buy a property but sell it within two to three years. That can happen. Yeah. And if even if we, you know, the example as good as it is that's up on the screen, that doesn't work in a, in a three year in a three-year time horizon. So sometimes it's just the reality of the nature of the investment that's being made in ultimate exit strategy may, may shut that door in certain cases. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder as we're heading into the end of our, our time here, if any of you um, can think of an example, I'm thinking from the uh, seller perspective now of, of a client that um, has, has made some investments and was able to collect the right data um, to you know, put some seasoning on that project and actually uh, claim um, a premium as a result of that? Or is it still kind of early too, too mixed to say or any kind of clear winners in it? You're working on a lot of pure in, the, in the pace I'm world. Sorry. I'm, yeah. I'm, well, I'm tracking that. Um, kind of, what's the state of the art? And I know this this information is fragmented, so I'm just asking since I have you guys and you all touch so many, so many. I, I would say that there has been, you know, certainly documentation that um, buildings that have be that have taken a more aggressive stance on energy efficiency have traded at higher, you know, uh, um, cost uh, or at higher pricing than ones that have not, and ones that are recognized. I mean, like. Portland, Oregon um, example, I mean, even 10 years ago, if it, if it didn't have a LEED certification, you weren't going to get top dollar for it. So again, it's somewhat ge- geographically disparate, but I think there definitely has been documentation, documentation in, in certain instances of, you know, the, the more efficient, but a lot of other qualities go with that as well in terms of quality of building, et cetera. But it's certainly been seen. So I, I can give you an example, Dave, of, of what you just described was a, uh... It was an, an office operator. This was actually a few years back, uh, but they wanted to take an office building to market. And they knew that the energy usage was horrendous. They could even see it themselves. They're going, this thing's going to, this is going to look horrible when we put this out there. So they asked us to go do a, an ASHRAE level one, I believe, energy audit, and then identify what could be done to improve it and then follow through on that and improve it so that when they put all this, you know, crummy energy usage out there <laughs> as part of the disclosures of, of the putting, putting the property on the market, they could say, look, yeah, we know that's bad, but here's what we did and it's going to be better now. So that would be a case. I would say that's more unusual than usual at this point, but that has shown up in that scenario. And there was a role that we played to help that 
uh, they actually retained us to do uh, retro commissioning of those right systems. Mm. that's right mm. to that was a total building tune-up before they sold it yep Right. They probably came out ahead of the game, though, by taking care of it, as opposed to what kind of penalty a potential buyer would have put on it, not knowing what what it would actually cost. Yeah, so, I, 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 I think this, this is my own opinion based on my own experiences. I, I, I don't buy and sell real estate, but in the feedback I get from my client base is if they can if they can disclose it and show that they've acted on it, they're less likely to get hit on a retrade. Right. And you know, then it just becomes a negotiation where somebody's picking a number, whether that's reflective of the cost of the work or not is I think second place. So right. when you right. can do those things and you're motivated to do those things, it ultimately, it, it, it follows this uh, cash flow diagram that you have up there. It's, it's a similar type of thing. Yep. Yep. And it, but it helps to, helps to manage that retrade issue. I think that's a great. Yeah. Point. I think that, and that's where you're getting a, a I guess a positive cross of being energy efficient, environmentally conscious and the like with, I'm going to get a better deal and make more money or lose less money. <laughs> right. Or have a deal or not have yeah, a project or, or as, a deal. as an example here, mm -hmm. right? a, a, a deal or no deal, a project or no project. I think, yeah, I think that's what we're, we're getting at here is, is uh, yeah, how can we get to a project and a deal um, without losing all the sustainability stuff? Cause it's just too hard. Right. So um, as we kind of head into close here, you know, final, final tip, final point. Um, if there's one thing that each of you would want to say about, about this, uh, this point about, um, capturing this, this moment, threading the needle, uh, what's the one thing that a client could do that would uh, make your job easier as you're trying to help them get this information that, you know, again, will help everybody execute on this ESG strategy. What's the one thing a, a client could do that would really help this process uh, for each of you? Hmm. Uh, I can, I'll start then. I, I can come up with one. Uh, it would be when, when ultimately prospective buyers of real estate are asking for all kinds of data. They want all the financial stuff on it. They want all the tax data. They want all historical operating expenses. And there's a significant amount of data that's always asked for. Include this kind of stuff. Include, you know, have you done any kind of energy audits in it? Have you made your ABB 802 disclosure if you're in the state of California? Um, incorporate that in there because it might flush that data out, which then can be used in that short DD time frame that shows up. Joe? Just stole my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, we can I, underline I, it. It's a it's a great point, but it, you know, it goes. We say, uh, you know, you me, you can manage what you measure. If it goes on the checklist, right, it, it gets it gets done. It gets supplied. So just looking at that that DD checklist, and I know Grasp has been um, making some some adjustments there too. I, I would offer that um, not so much how they would help me, but I would give the advice to any, you know, um, building owner or um, uh, investor that if they had the opportunity to be involved in, in the appraisal process, to be sure they're dealing with someone who has some knowledge of high performing buildings, energy efficiency, things of that nature. Um, uh, they certainly, uh, banks or lenders are the ones that typically choose appraisers, but that doesn't mean an owner or developer couldn't ask that whoever they choose have, be experienced in that area. Oftentimes it saves everyone. It makes it easier on the owner and the appraiser because they know what information to ask for. And um, uh, that, that would be my hint in terms of, you know, helping this whole process along. And, and take advantage of those Appraisal Institute uh, resources and courses. Sure. Study up. Yeah. All right. Be proactive, yes. Exactly right. Well, our, our audience today absolutely is. And, and uh, I'd like to end with these quotes. I love this one. Um, what you do makes a difference. You have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. And, and uh, you guys are making a difference today. Thank you for your time, all of our speakers, all of you for joining this afternoon. I hope you found this conversation fun as I did. Um, thank you all. And we'll be in touch with the slides before the end of the week. And uh, please do keep in touch. Um, reach out to us, get engaged. 
Uh, we're always looking to grow the program, looking for ideas of, of timely topics to dive into. So thank you all for joining and we'll be in touch soon. Take care. Thank you.